and welcome to Jim's Garage. This is the first episode in a series dedicated to home loving. So you want to begin home loving and self-hosting services, but you don't know where to start. Great, you've come to the right place. I'll take you step by step through my journey from solo hosting applications on a dedicated machine, right the way up to running your own Kubernetes environment with high availability, internet accessible services, automated backups, firewall failover, all balanced across multiple virtual machines. I'm gonna share with you everything I learned along the way. Hopefully I can make you avoid some of the pitfalls I encountered when I started, help you to make the right choices from the start and avoid quite literally weeks of frustration by building it right from the start. This is the first episode in a series that will focus on how you can begin to home lab. I'll start off slow, I'll explain the concepts, talk about why I wanted to do this and some of the reasons why I think others should. I'll cover the shopping list and how to get started, something I've often found missing in other YouTube series. One thing for me, it really is much easier to begin than you may think. You probably very likely are already on a device that can currently do this. This series will be a bit like a train journey There'll be many stops along the way and you can jump off whenever you feel you've reached your needs. You can jump back on again at any time. For the brave, each episode will build upon previous work, expanding capability, replication, adding new features, new services, more security, and finally moving towards a more automated enterprise setup. We'll discuss how to deploy many well-known services like Nginx, Traffic, Pi-hole, TrueNAS, SOFOS, Plex, Unify, and a whole host more. We'll talk about networking, virtualization, containers, high availability, security, firewalls, VPNs, hardware, and everything else in between in a way that I hope is simple to understand and relevant to what you're trying to achieve. The sessions will not only be configuration on command line. I'll also be looking through actual builds of my servers, what hardware goes in it, where you can buy that hardware, and what's some of the best value for money right now. By the end of this series, you'll be able to go from a single physical machine running services, all the way to a full Kubernetes cluster with high availability, persistent storage, and automated build, deploy, and backup to the cloud-based storage, or wherever you want to store. So why do I home lab? Many of you likely have a job in technology or a vested interest in it. I happen to tick both of those boxes. Perhaps you want to increase your knowledge by learning at home. Perhaps you want to play with enterprise toys at home to upskill and join the workplace conversation. That's certainly why I wanted to do this. Perhaps you want to break the status quo. You want to reduce subscription fees, maintain data privacy, Use your infrastructure so you know who's looking at your data. That, again, was another key reason why I want to do this. What were your reasons? Why are you here? Let me know in the comments below. So how did I get here? I started my home lab journey with a single PC. This was my daily driver that I used for work and play. I began by installing a few services, which unfortunately then meant I needed to keep my PC on at all times which is not ideal for many reasons. And the OS that I was using at the time, Windows 10, it just isn't designed for that setup. So then I moved on with my limited understanding and a mixture of cost and expedience. I expanded to another cheap physical PC. So I had two physical PCs. This was similar to my main PC, but considerably cheaper. It didn't have a GPU, for example. However, it was still running a Windows desktop environment. The next step with a career in security, I wanted to replace the ISP firewall. More accurately, it was a case of switching the ISP firewall into modem only mode and building my own router and firewall alongside a managed switch. For this, I chose Sophos UTM because at the time it seemed to fit the bill. Um, we'll be doing more on that later. Next, with the use of multiple physical machines, I needed a way to rapidly access and manage them. RDP to the rescue. Yes, I did say that we were going to cover the basics, and I'm not ashamed to confess how little I knew at the time. 
So by configuring RDP and having a proper firewall in place, it gave me the opportunity to remotely manage and secure external services. We'll do a whole host of videos on how we do that and how we can harden them later on in the series. Next up was something I'd put off for far too long, what I call learning to Linux. Obviously, modern enterprise pretty much runs on Linux, certainly in the back-end server infrastructure, applications, etc. And you'll see a big, a number of the big names having a significant percentage of their estate being Linux-based. Many of the applications I wanted to run had headless servers that were Linux-specific, so my existing Windows setup, Windows 10, um, it just wasn't going to work. Often, these headless servers... Um, would be more performant due to lack of Windows emulation and also had significantly reduced system resources, meaning that I get a much higher return on investment. Coming from a lifetime in Windows, the sheer variety and options available in selecting which Linux distro you want to run was pretty baffling. I'm now happy with my choices. You should note the plural in what I just said. We'll discuss more about which distros I use and why and what might be a good fit for what you're trying to achieve. Now it was time to start optimizing my hardware as it was clear that I had multiple devices that were severely underutilized. The solution to this problem was virtualization which meant I could run multiple virtual machines as though they were separate physical computers. This was a lifesaver at the time as living space was tight, funds were limited and I've always strived to reduce energy consumption and maximize re my return on that hardware investment. From my initial research and not wanting to go too fast, I stuck with what I felt I could handle, Hyper-V on Windows 10. This is a great option for dipping your toe into the world of virtualization and will feature in an upcoming video. It gives you the benefits of virtualization and the familiarity of the Windows GUI environment. So I always felt as though I was in control. The next step was to address one of the shortcomings I mentioned earlier, the need for a persistent OS that is designed to be operational 24-7. The logical choice for me at the time was Hyper-V 2016, which gave me a free tier one hypervisor and many out of the box features that just played nicely with Windows 10. Things such as being able to remotely manage through Hyper-V Manager, which is already a part of Windows 10. I was then rapidly in a position where I had multiple virtual machines on my server, all running my applications. No longer was I having one machine pretty much per service. I thought I was done. How little I knew, as goes home loving. Security was the next item to address and significantly helped by the adoption of VLANs. Key to these were the segmentation of my internet facing services into a DMZ. This greatly reduced the chances of an attacker being able to compromise one of my services and propagate over my network onto personal machines and personal data. Next up was the realization that having a VM per application isn't scalable and soon choose through limited consumer grade equipment, basically putting me in the same place as I was before with the physical machines. So welcome to the world of containers and Docker. Moving to Docker was another steep learning curve. No longer did I have the familiar sense of walking through a nice install wizard. Instead, I was diving into YAML files and static configurations. Whilst this initial hurdle took some getting used to, once you've done it, wow, it is a time saver. Being able to create a working config gives you the ability to spin up containers that are consistent and repeatable. This was a huge win. As my home lab grew, so did my needs for reliable storage. By now, I'd heard great things about TrueNAS, formerly FreeNAS, which you'll see from my examples is still the name of my dataset, and I've begun building a NAS server. TrueNAS has been absolutely rock solid for me, and whilst there are competitors that are well worth a shout, we'll cover those later, I've taken the approach of, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. I'll be doing a number of videos on TrueNAS in the coming series from both the hardware options to the features of the OS. It's even becoming a viable option for deploying and managing your VMs and containers, actually using it to host both Kubernetes clusters and for hosting your virtual machines. 
At this point, I was largely happy with my setup and probably could have lived with it, but I had this unresolved itch to move to Kubernetes. I failed a couple of times, I gave up a couple of times before finally managing to move over. This was another steep learning curve for me, but I hope I can share with you how I did it and spell out some of the ways to make your journey easier. I can tell you that it's well worth it when you get there for many of the same reasons that Docker and scripted config is, easier maintenance. And for me now, I definitely spend far less time um, diagnosing, fixing issues because all of my environment is scripted and it works out of the box. Next, one problem I'd always had was that with a single firewall, I had a single point of failure. Yes, I do have other single points of failure and we'll get onto those. However, especially since my firewall is virtualized, any reset of my host machine brought my network down. This was very bad for the wife approval factor. High availability to the rescue, something that is surprisingly easy to accomplish with Sophos XG, and I'll be doing a video of that in the future. What this allowed me to do was update any of my hosts, sort of sequentially, without bringing down any of my network. So where am I? Now I'm living with K3S. For those who don't know, that's a lightweight version of Kubernetes. We'll come on to that later. In high availability, and life is so much easier. It was a hell of a journey to get here, but the time I spent maintaining my home lab has been significantly reduced. Auto healing and failover has meant that many of my previous issues have simply been resolved. I forget the number of times a service would drop out due to a network reset or a drop in an SMB connection. My current last piece of the puzzle has been a move towards GitOps and using Fleet in Rancher. This means I can deploy my infrastructure as code and not have to worry about specifying a number of commands to deploy each time. This makes changes much easier and I'm more productive using a fully fledged IDE such as VS Code that can push my config straight to GitHub and is automatically deployed. Well, that's a whistle stop tour of where I've come from and where I'm at. I've condensed much of this video that's possible to make it manageable and hopefully something that isn't going to overwhelm you. I hope that you will join me on this journey as I walk you through the steps to do this in your own lab. Look out for my next video in the series where I'll be taking you through some of the devices you may wish to consider for your first venture into home labbing. Thanks for joining. See you on the next video.